25 years after my book's publication, Orientalism once again raises the question of whether modern imperialism ever ended or whether it has continued in the Orient since Napoleon's entry into Egypt two, two centuries ago. Arabs and Muslims have been told that victimology and dwelling on the depredations of empire is only a way of evading responsibility in the present. You have failed. You have gone wrong, says the modern Orientalist, and you can't blame the empire. You did it. This, of course, is also V.S. Naipaul's contribution to literature, that the victims of empire wail on while their country goes to the dogs. But what a shallow calculation of the imperial intrusion that is. How summarily it scans the immense distortion introduced by the empire into the lives of lesser peoples and subject races generation after generation. How little it wishes to face the long succession of years through which empire continues to work its way in the lives, say, of Palestinians or Congolese or Algerians or Iraqis. We allow justly that the Holocaust has permanently altered the consciousness of our time. Why do we not accord the same epistemological mutation in what imperialism has done and what Orientalism continues to do? Think of the line that starts with Napoleon, continues with the rise of Oriental studies and the takeover of North Africa, and goes on in similar undertakings in Vietnam, in Egypt, in Palestine, and during the entire 20th century in the struggle over oil and strategic control in the Gulf, in Iraq, Syria, Palestine, Afghanistan. Then think contrapuntally of the rise of anti-colonial nationalism through the short period of liberal independence, then the era of military coup, of insurgency, civil war, religious fanaticism, irrational struggle, and uncompromising brutality against the latest bunch of natives. Each of these phrases and eras produces its own distorted knowledge of the other, each its own reductive images, its own disputations, disputatious polemics. My idea in Orientalism was to use humanistic critique to open up the fields of struggle, to introduce a longer sequence of thought and analysis to replace the short bursts of polemical, thought-stopping fury that so imprisons us in labels and antagonistic debate whose goal is collective passion rather than understanding and intellectual exchange. I've called what I try to do humanism, a word I continue to use stubbornly despite the scornful dismissal of the term by sophisticated postmodern critics. By humanism, I mean, first of all, attempting to dissolve Blake's mind-forged manacles so as to be able to use one's mind historically and rationally for the purposes of reflective understanding and genuine disclosure. Moreover, humanism is sustained by a sense of community with other interpreters and other societies and periods. Strictly speaking, therefore, there is no such thing as an isolated humanist. Second, humanism is centered upon the agency of human individuality and subjective intuition rather than on received ideas and approved authority. Texts have to be read as texts that were produced and live on in the historical realm in all sorts of what I have called worldly ways. But this by no means excludes power, since on the contrary, what I've tried to show in this book have been the insinuations, the imbrications of power into even the most recondite of studies. And last, most important, Humanism is the only, and I would go so far as saying, the final resistance we have against the inhuman practices and injustices that disfigure human history. We are today abetted by the enormously encouraging field of cyberspace open to all users in ways undreamt of by earlier generations, either of tyrants or of orthodoxies. The worldwide protests before the war began in Iraq would not have been possible were it not for the existence of alternative communities all across the world, energized by alternative information 
and keenly aware of the environmental human rights and libertarian impulses that bind us together in this tiny planet. The human and humanistic desire for enlightenment and emancipation is not easily deferred, despite the strength of the opposition to it that comes from the Rumsfelds, the Bin Ladens, the Sharons, and Bushes of this world. I would like to believe that my book, Orientalism, has had a small place in the long and often interrupted road to human freedom. Thank you.